1 Peter, the letter to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want, to, I want to, to share with you chapter 5. Um, let, let's pick up with verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Did you catch that? Cast all your anxiety, or all of your worry, or all of your fear, on him because he cares for you be self-controlled and alert your enemy the devil prowls a lot around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. There's a whole lot crammed in these few verses right here, and we're not going to begin to nearly cover everything today. Um, but I, I, I want to, to just say this. You can expect suffering. It's going to happen. Mark it down. You may be doing okay today, but tomorrow's coming. And with it can come all kinds of things. Suffering, pain, fear, even worry. After you have suffered a little while, Peter says, it's going to happen. But he tells us something very interesting. He says, cast all your care upon him. Because he cares. He cares for you. Frank Grafe was born in 1860 in northeastern Pennsylvania. When he entered the ministry, one of his greatest assets was his cheerful disposition. And in the 1800s, late 1800s, he pastored over in the Philadelphia area. He got a nickname. He was dubbed the Sunshine Minister because of his radiant personality. He had a special way about him. The children loved him. The elderly respected him. He was the Sunshine Minister. But hardships came. Disappointments came. Heartache came. And Pastor Frank found himself in the, the slew of despair. Depressed. He went through a deep, dark hole. And he couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And he did what we have to do. He collapsed into the everlasting arms of the Almighty. He read the truth and he reread the truth over and over again. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety, casting all of your care, casting all of your worry, casting all of your fear, upon him because he cares for you. He read it, reread it over and over and over and over and over again. And he went on to write, does Jesus care? And it goes like this. 
Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for the mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Does Jesus care when my way is dark with the nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed? to resist some temptation strong. When my deep grief, I find no relief, though my tears flow all the night long. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it aught to him? Does he see? Oh yes. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. He cares. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. How do we, how do, we do that? How do we cast all of our cares upon Him? How do we do that? You know, many of us are carrying heavy burdens that are, are too big for you to carry. The burdens are too great. What does he want us to do? He wants us to just cast them. Cast them on him. Let him take care of it. Imagine picking up a big 50-pound bag of potatoes. Picture that in your mind, if you will. Now, some of you would struggle, in fact, I would probably struggle, picking, picking that up. Okay? We'd get wobbly. We wouldn't walk, be able to walk real far with that bag of potatoes. We'd get tired would get winded. And what does Jesus say? He says, casting your care, your burden on Him. And it's like, it's like taking it and, and casting it, throwing it to Him. Let Him do it. Let Him take care of it. Remember the story of, of, of the disciples when they were out fishing all night? They had fished all night. They had come to shore. They were cleaning up their nets, getting them all ready for maybe the next day or the next night when they were going to go back out and, and they were going to fish again. They had fished all night. I've done that a couple of times in my life. And I'll tell you what, you can't wait till the sun peeks up over the mountain so you can go home and go to bed. Okay? And I imagine they were probably feeling that same way. They were tired. They were weary. And then Jesus comes and he says, push out and cast your net over on the, the other side. You know what their response was? Lord, we, we fished all night. We fished all night. He said, yeah, but cast it on the other side. And being obedient, they did. And what happened? He just, when they pulled it in, it was loaded with fish. So much so that the net started breaking. I mean, that's kind of what God wants us to do. Listen to Him and just cast it. Cast it on Him. Let Him take care of it. Be obedient. Listen to what He says. Cast your care upon Him. Commit your burden to the Lord. Give it over to Him who cares even more about it than you do. And... And I might ought to add, and who has the power to do something about it. You know, many of the burdens and many of the hardships and many of the worries that you have, you can't do anything about it. Even the sickness that you have, you can't do anything about it. Oh, you can take some pills and you can listen to the doctor and you can get plenty of rest and, and all of that, but you, you still have to take your care. You still have to take your worry. You've got to give it to him. Say, God, I can't do anything about this. But he can. 
He's got the power. He's got the wisdom. He can take care of it. You know, the psalmist said, Psalm 37, 5, Commit your way to the Lord. Commit it to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. He'll do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday. You see, you have to commit your burden and, and all of upon Him, and He'll take care of it. Notice He doesn't say, you won't have burdens. Don't think for one moment that being a Christian is a bed of ease. It's not. It's not easy. You're going to get sick just like everybody else. You're going to have worries and concerns just like everybody else. You're going to have the hardships. Your, your phone's going to ring. There's going to be somebody on the other end of that phone that, that's going to give to you bad news. But what do you do? You've got to give it to God. Say, God, I can't do anything about it. It's out of my control. I've got to commit it to you. You've got to do it. You think it was easy for Joseph? When... In his life, it was one thing after another. Sometimes I, I, I think of Joseph and I, I can't hardly imagine what he must have gone through to think that his brothers would betray him. To think that people would lie against him. To think that I'm sure there were times when he thought that God doesn't even answer my prayers. I mean, it was one thing after another, after another. But you know, God was doing some amazing things in Joseph's life, and Joseph didn't even realize it. And there are times when we go through this pain and these heartaches and these concerns that we have, and we don't know why, and there's times we say, God, don't you even care? And if we get quiet enough, we could hear God say, oh, yes, I care. But I've got a bigger picture for you. I've got something in mind. I've got something in store. I've got something great and wonderful for you. And God certainly did for Joseph. God had to allow these things to come into Joseph's life so God could get Joseph right where he wanted him. Down in Egypt, in a prison, a dungeon, so that he could give him audience to the king. And so he could get promoted second unto the king. God had a purpose. You think life was easy for Daniel? When Daniel got word that he was going to be thrown into the lion's den? Think about that. Daniel knew what happens when you get thrown into the lion's den. Daniel knew that they starve those lions, that when the meat's thrown in, they'd gobble it up. And him being the meat, he knew what was laying ahead. But, did it stop Daniel? No, he kept praying. You know the rest of that story. You could ask Paul, Paul, was his life easy? Is it easy being a Christian? He'd say, yeah, if you think being shipwrecked and being stoned and being beaten and seeing about every dungeon uh, there was to see, being stoned. But you know, if we were to ask these men, was it worth it? Would you go through it again? They'd say, Absolutely. For God will do anything. But you, folks, you've got to give it to God. Commit it to God. Notice what James says. James says this. Consider it pure joy. Now think about that. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Consider it pure joy. You mean when I go through the trials of life, that's joy? James is saying, consider it pure joy. Consider it a privilege. Consider it an opportunity. Consider it a learning process. Consider it that God wants to grow you. And that's why God allows the, the heartaches and the disappointments and the difficulties into your life. Because God wants to grow you and help you to become the better. So what is your problem today? What is the concern on your heart? The message this morning is to give it to God. Give it to God. In Psalm 37, where it says, Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in Him. That's in verse 5. In verse 7, it says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Be still before the Lord. Don't gripe and grumble and complain. Don't take a negative spirit. You know, you don't have to jump up and down and say, oh, oh, this is great. I love going through this trial. No, we're not saying do that. In fact, we'd probably think there was something wrong with you if you did that. But they're saying, you know, be still before God. Take it to God in prayer. Commit it to God. Realize that God has a purpose for everything that happens in your life. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to understand it. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to explain it. That doesn't mean you're going to know the outcome of it. But be still before the Almighty and take it to Him in prayer. Ask for His help in prayer. Philippians 4 says, Tell us, or tells us, to be anxious about nothing, but in everything. Did you catch that word? In everything. By prayer and supplication, let your needs be made known to the Lord. In everything. That means whether you're sick. That means whether you get bad news. That means whether, you know, your job's on the line or, or, or whether the finances collapse or the cars break down or the kids get sick or whatever happens. In everything. Take it to God in prayer. My third point is search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. We have to commit it to God. We have to ask God. We need to search the scriptures. God has a promise for every need. We used to sing that song, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. All the blessings of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. God has given to us his word. His word to encourage us. His word to help us. We need to get into the word of God. Someone wrote, generation follows generation, yet it lives. Nations rise and nations fall, yet it lives. Kings, dictators, presidents come and go, yet it lives. Hatred or hated, despised and cursed, yet it lives. Doubted, suspected and criticized, yet it lives. Condemned by atheists, yet it lives. Scoffed at by scorners, yet it lives. A exaggerated by fanatics, yet it lives. Misconstructed and mistreated, yet it lives. Ranted and raved about, yet it lives. Its, ins its inspiration is denied, yet it lives. Yet it lives. It lives as a lamp to our feet. Yet it lives as a light to our path. Yet it lives as the gate to heaven. As a standard for childhood. As a guide for youth. As an inspiration for the matured. As a comfort for the aged. 
as food for the hungry, as water for the thirsty, as rest for the weary, as light for the heathen, as salvation for the sinner, yet it lives as grace for the Christian. To know it is to love it. To love it is to accept it. To accept it means eternal life. How do we make the best use of God's word? Well, we need to read it. We need to pray it in. We need to note it down. And then we need to pass it on. Paul's second letter to Timothy gives him a charge to keep. He writes concerning the word of God. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture. All scripture. Not some of it. Not most of it. But all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of God is the greatest of all roadmaps. It will take you where you need to go. Allow it to become a part of your daily life. The word of God. The word of God is as much relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. The Word of God. It needs to be read. It needs to be memorized. It needs to be applied to our lives. It needs to be something we think about on a daily basis. Get into the Word of God. And you'll be amazed what God wants to say to you. The fourth point is simply this. Trust Him. Trust Him because He does care for you. To trust is to have the utmost faith in. To cast your worries and cares before Him. To trust even though you don't understand what is happening. To trust even though it don't make sense. To trust even though you can't do anything about it. To trust even though your hands are tied. story is told of a tightrope walker. He had a tightrope high up in the air, tied to two huge buildings. And he began to walk back and forth on this tightrope, back and forth, back and forth. And the crowd below began to notice, and they began to look up, and they began to point. And, and as they began to do that, more and more people came, and more and more people came. And then finally he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a blindfold and he put it on. And he began blindly walking across that tightrope forwards and, and backwards. And the crowd below were in awe, thinking, wow, he's amazing. And then he got a wheelbarrow. He put a wheelbarrow on the rope and he began to to walk across the rope, pushing a wheelbarrow, frontwards and, and then backwards. And the crowd were all in amazed. And then he yelled to the crowd below, Do you think I can do it? Do you think I can do it again? And they all yelled, Yes, you can do it. And then he said this, who would like to come up and sit in the wheelbarrow? And nobody wanted to. Nobody wanted to. You know, when I read that story, I thought, you know, that's, that's about right. It's easy for us to tell somebody else, oh, just give it to God. Trust God. God will take care of it. It'll be all right. But, what happens when it comes to, to us? What happens when our world begins to fall apart? What happens when our world begins to collapse? 
Are we trusting God? Are we giving it to God? Let me close with this story. It was a dark night and the train was loaded with passengers and as they were speeding down the the tracks, it began to, to thunder and lightning and all the rain just began to just pour down and you could hear the rain hitting the windows of, of the train and the lightning was bright and it just kept flashing and the thunderbolts were, were loud and people were getting afraid. An older woman looked over and seen a little fella sitting in the seat. He was sitting there just kind of playing with his cars and a few trucks he had there not paying any attention to the noise outside and the storm that was engulfing them. And the sweet old lady went over to the little fellow and she said, Sonny, she said, aren't you afraid of the storm outside? He said, nope. She said, well, why aren't you afraid? Don't you hear it thundering and lightning? Don't you see it? He said, yep. But why aren't you afraid? And he looked up at the lady and he said, Ma'am, my dad's driving the train. My dad's driving the train. I want to tell you something. In life, God wants to drive your life. God wants to be in control. And we ought to be able to rest. We ought to be able to be as calm going through the storms of life as that little boy was sitting on that train in the storm. Knowing that his dad was in charge. His dad was driving the train. Hey, who's driving your train? Who's in charge of your life? Do you really, really believe in the word of God? Do you believe that the Word of God is, is really what it says? That He is the God of impossibilities? That He is the God that can do all things? That He is the God that has a plan for your life and wants what's best for you? Do you really believe it? If you really do, then you ought to be able to take the promises in the book and you ought to be able to sing, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. All the blessings of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. And when we're going through the battles and the struggles of life, and we will go through them, we ought to be able to look up and say, God, I'm laying them down to you. I'm giving them to you. I'm casting them to you. Because I know you're driving my life. It's yours. I'll tell you what. That helps you sleep pretty good at night. Will you stand with me? Eternal Father. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for what you want to do in our life. Thank you that you want us to cast our burdens at your feet. Father, you want to carry our burdens. You want to take our worries. You want to take our fears. You want to take the things that trouble us and concern us. And you want, you want to bless our life. You want to put a smile on our face. You want to put joy in our hearts. And so, Lord, help us as we go through life to stand on the promises and trust you. Father, will you touch John right now? Know that they left early today, and I don't think he was feeling too well. And so, Father, I just pray that you would just touch them and continue to bring healing to his body. Have your way now as we go our separate ways. Give unto us a great week. And oh God, for all that you do for us, 
will give you the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.